So good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, BPH part of the uh, Endo section literature update. And um, here I'm going to present uh, the papers that have caught my eye with regards to BPH since BAUS 2019, when I uh, did the literature update uh, last. So um, there's some disclosures to, uh, to for you there, but moving on to the first paper. Um, this has just been published online in the Journal of Endourology, and it's a systematic review looking at true day case surgery for BPH. And this caught my eye for a number of reasons. Um, it's a reasonable size systematic review, 20 studies, 1600 patients. But the key thing for me is it's true day case surgery and their criteria was those with a hospital stay of less than 12 hours. So it wasn't uh, people who were staying overnight who might've had an operation uh, in an evening. The other key thing is it uses standard well-established BPH techniques. So it reports on TURP, green lights, laser, and HOLAP. And it's a nice meta-analysis, systematic review, controlling for literature bias and heterogeneity of studies. The primary outcome that they report on is the failure to deliver a day case surgery. And this was 12% for HOLAP, 7% for green light, and 3% for TURP. As part of this, they report that the larger prostates over 40 mils have a significantly higher failure for day case surgery compared with small prostates at 4%. A secondary outcome is unplanned emergency outpatient review. And this was more likely with larger prostate volumes and longer operative time, but interestingly wasn't affected by technique or the ASA of the patient. So some limitations for me were they, there was a relatively small amount of TURP studies in it uh, and the heter heterogeneity of study design and also it was unclear as to exactly the experience of uh, HOLEP with the surgeons and we know this has a bearing on outcome. But the take home messages are that safe outcomes are demonstrated within this study for true day case procedures and most importantly they're established BPH techniques, which form the backbone of BPH surgery in, in the UK. Longer operative time, larger prostates and more complex procedures, and by that they mean HOLEP, will affect the day case rates and lower it, um, and it will affect unplanned reviews. But I think this is a really good study which encourages us all to have a look critically at our day case pathways and really encourage people to try and push the amount of day case surgery we're doing because it does have uh, clear, clear beneficial outcomes and is safe from this study. When I did the literature review last year, there was an awful lot on new minimally invasive techniques. And this year, the literature is, appears a little bit more dominated by more established techniques. And this is a nice study from the Journal of Endourology in the summer, which is a randomized trial of 145 patients comparing HOLEP with bipolar TURP for men with large prostates. And their cutoff for large prostates was over 75 cc, so a reasonable sized prostate. They have two years of follow-up and it's a single surgeon who's experienced in both procedures performing uh, the surgery. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's helpful. Interesting that the groups were matched, um, but the HOLEP group did have uh, more antiplatelet or anticoagulant medications, significantly more than the, the bipolar TURP group. So the outcomes they report are that HOLEP has a shorter operative time, uh, a lower haemoglobin drop, a shorter period of catheterization postoperatively, a shorter hospital stay, and more tissue um, is removed with equi equivalent complication profiles for HOLEP and bipolar TURP. They report at two years that HOLEP also has a better percentage improvement in terms of IPSS and quality of life, which was significant. So for me, they report, they claim long-term outcomes. I think two years follow-up is a, a relatively short-term follow-up for me. But the take-home messages for this study is that in men with genuinely large prostates, that HOLAP does have significant um, perioperative benefits in terms um, compared with bipolar TURP for men with large prostates. 
It does also have for two years some significant improvements in IPSS and quality of life. But I think if you look at the actual numbers, I think patients may find it difficult to truly differentiate that um, statistical significance. So the next study is looking at a, a, a new type of laser, so thulmium laser, um, but a vapor resection technique um, and comparing it with uh, TURP. And this is a, a UK study, a randomized trial of 400, uh, 400 men based down in Bristol, the study um, published in the Lancet called the Unblocks trial. So seven UK centers and they randomized men to thulmium vapor resection or conventional TURP, and that could be monopolar or bipolar, depending on the center's preference. A nice study included retention patients, moderate size, moderate to small size prostates at 20 to 50 grams, and a nice clever study design with the follow-up uh, masked for the surgeon and the, the, and the clinicians and the patients uh, masked to the procedure during the follow-up period out to a year. They report equivalent outcomes for IPSS outcomes, equivalent QMAX out, uh, sorry, for QMAX, TURP had a superior outcome at a year. Length of stay and transfusion outcomes were equivalent, as were quality of life outcomes equivalent, and complications were equivalent. The limitations with the study was that there was some conversion interoperatively of thulmium across to TURP, which may have affected the study. And also the experience of the surgeons, it was the, the surgeons were much less experienced in thulmium vapor resection than they were with TURP. So the take home message for me was with all these new techniques that we get um, told about and new lasers and um, there's a number of anticipated benefits, whether it be shorter length of stay or less complications that we're told about. But this is a nice study which shows that the anticipated benefits with laser thulmium vapor resection have not been demonstrated in this well-designed study over conventional TURP. TURP actually provided a better flow in, um, statistically. Um, and I think it makes the point that actually TURP does have a role and new BPH treatments should continue to be compared to TURP. Um, and it's nice to see monopolar and bipolar being combined um, as, a, as a single modality for comparison. This next study uh, really caught my eye and I, th I thought it was a, it's a, a great dilemma and one uh, that's uh, nice to see answered. So what do you do when you set out to do a TURP and you come across an incidental bladder tumour? And this systematic review published in the BJUI in the summer looks at um, that question. So does simultaneous TURBT and TURP lead to an increased risk of recurrence or progression of the bladder tumour. It's a systematic review, 11 studies, but incorporates three random controls, randomised controlled trials, 1,600 patients, and it has some tumours which are over three centimetres and some tumour types with concomitant CIS. It also includes some studies where the protocol was to give mitomycin postoperatively after combined TURBT and TURP. And they reported on recurrence, and that was as whole bladder occurrences, as well as recurrences within the bladder, neck and prostatic urethra. And they also reported on progression to more sinister urethelial bladder tumours. Limitations within the study were that it was a, a relatively low number of RCTs, and it was difficult to do subgroup analysis or really understand what the implications of having given mitomycin are, or for the more riskier tumour subgroup, subgroups such as additional CIS as the numbers were very small and it was difficult to draw, impossible to draw conclusions. But the take home message for me is that for patients um, with an incidental bladder tumour, there's no clinically significant or meaningful differences in recurrence or progression of the bladder tumour if you perform a simultaneous TURBT and TURP. And so it obviously appears safer than many of us might have expected. And I think there's some caveats to this. I think if, the, if there's multifocal, a significant burden of bladder tumour, then, then you wouldn't do a, a simultaneous resection. Um, likewise, if it looked like a solid bladder tumour, you wouldn't do a simultaneous resection. But for the incidental, unexpected small tumour, I think this is a nice study and um, perhaps should give us the confidence to complete both procedures. 
So moving on um, with BPH techniques, there's a uh, BPH surgery, there's a number of different techniques out there. And this uh, is a, a study from the Netherlands um, reported in urology earlier this year, which looked at using a web-based decision aid to help patients understand their treatment options and give them information. And I think this is uh, a great objective uh, to allow patients to evaluate their treatment preferences using a, a web-based decision aid. The web-based decision aid was designed to discriminate between three treatments, lifestyle advice, medications and surgery. And uh, within the study, they used 126 patients, of which were third were treatment naive. So they could uh, decide between lifestyle advice or medications. Two thirds of patients were on medications already. And so for them, the decision was whether they continued with medications or moved on to a surgical option. And so the outcomes from using this tool they report are that 50% of patients who were previously undecided about a treatment uh, prior to using the decision aid, after using the decision aid, indicated a preference. And 80% of patients who had indicated a preference prior to using the tool, after using the tool, confirmed that the, uh, their, their preference. Uh, the majority of questions within the tool were also discriminative of a final treatment option. And I thought this was um, a nice study um, and demonstrates the, the, the importance and perhaps value of giving a broad uh, standardized information for patients on treatment options. One of the dangers with many BPH modality treatments around is that people only offer what they offer and don't always potentially counsel patients about um, multiple treatment options if they're not available by them or in their center. And so a web-based decision aid like this will allow patients potentially better information, better counseling, uh, resulting more engaged patients with potentially uh, better treatment concordance. So I thought a nice idea and, uh, and nice to see um, decision aids and online information being more available for, for, for the benign group of patients that we're looking after here. The final study um, that caught my eye to incorporate in this uh, in this uh, piece this evening was um, looking at um, people who'd had HOLEP and looking at those patients who went on to uh, develop prostate cancer and looking at whether or not the PSA following their HOLEP may predict their risk of future prostate cancer. And this was a retrospective study, but a decent number of patients, 773. Um, and all the patients had had holeps with benign histology. They had rigorous follow-up with a PSA at six weeks, three months, and then a year. During their follow-up uh, and afterwards, they would have investigations for prostate cancer prompted by an abnormal DRE, MRI findings, and if, if an MRI had been arranged, a PSA rise of greater than two above their nadir postoperatively, or a higher PSA result uh, immediately after their HOLEP than preoperatively. And the outcomes they report is that um, the first PSA um, after their HOLEP, providing it's within 12 months of the operation, can independently predict prostate cancer on multivariate analysis. And they looked at a cutoff and identified a PSA of 1.73 or above as a sensitivity and specificity of over 80% for prostate cancer. And interestingly, of those prostate cancers identified and detected, 83% of those were significant with a grade group two or higher. There were some limitations with this study, it's retrospective, and there was incomplete PSA follow-up in, in a large number of patients. And clinical bias and age will affect the follow-up protocol within this study and the threshold to investigate PSA rises. But for someone who does HOLEP, and I think you know, it'd be interesting to explore this for other BPH surgeries, um, taking a, first, a PSA within the first year after HOLEP um, is an interesting independent predictor of future prostate cancer diagnosis and certainly has opened my eyes to identifying patients who have a PSA of over 1.73 within the first year. They perhaps should have a, a more rigorous follow-up and a lower threshold to investigate them going forwards um, for prostate cancer. 
So those were the BPH studies um, in a little bit of depth for you that caught my eye this year. Um, a slightly different slant to the minimally invasive procedures that I presented last year, but some interesting studies uh, with some nice take home messages and certainly a few things for people to think about and in to integrate into uh, our, our practice here in the UK. So um, I hope that's been helpful um, and I enjoyed, enjoyed doing it for the endourology section. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do the uh, endo urology literature update for 2020. Um, I have looked through the publications uh, for stone surgery uh, for the last year and summarised a few that have caught my eye, which I hope you find interesting. Uh, we also have a talk uh, about BPH, uh, also from the endo urology side of things, uh, but I won't be covering that. Um, so. These are my uh, disclosures before I start. So I've divided these um, uh, sort of topics, if you like, into various uh, subheadings. Uh, the first uh, grouping is uh, literature relating to epidemiology of kidney stones. Um, and uh, this one uh, gives us an update on uh, trends in the number of stone patients presenting in the USA. Um, which is always interesting to see how things are changing with time. Um, as previously, um, around 12% of the US population in this study um, will develop a stone. Um, but interestingly, the number of women uh, presenting with kidney stones has increased uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. And that's uh, quite a significant increase uh, in women. Uh, and particularly in women under the age of 60. And so this probably will translate into uh, ever increasing stone burden as uh, women catch up with men in terms of prevalence and incidence of these stones. And so although men still have a slightly higher prevalence of kidney stones, uh, the gap is closing. Uh, and uh, this probably is due to uh, dietary and uh, fluid intake issues um, as a women follow men's uh, dietary and lifestyle behaviors. Uh, but it does mean that there'll be a bigger burden for, uh, for all of us to cope with. Uh, the second uh, epidemiology uh, paper that caught my eye uh, was in the BJUI uh, in December last year. And this uh, study from uh, China was a prospective cohort study uh, with nearly 10,000 participants. Um, without stones. Uh, these patients, were, these participants were followed up uh, for nearly three years and 7% of them developed new stones, incident stones. And they looked at all the factors uh, in their lifestyle, which may influence the fact whether or not they formed stones. And they found that new, new onset of hypertension, uh, diabetes and, and obesity were all independent uh, risk factors in multivariate analysis uh, for new stone formation. So um, again, coming back to the volumes of cases, um, as the incidence of these uh, conditions um, go up, which they are doing in our society, um, we can expect uh, ever increasing numbers of uh, kidney stones to form. Um, this uh, is a publication from Oxford. Uh, and we uh, looked at the UK Biobank, and in the Biobank there were nearly half a million participants available for analysis, and uh, 2,057 of these had had hospital admissions with kidney stones uh, with six years of follow-up. And the UK Biobank collected huge amounts of data on patients around their lifestyle, diet, um, blood tests, very comprehensive data. And we interrogated this looking at the dietary side of things. Um, we found similar things to many other epidemiology studies to do with stones. Uh, fruit and fiber intake was associated with low risk. Meat and salt was associated with higher risk. Um, and vegetables, fish and cheese was not associated with kidney stone risk. Uh, but fluid intake uh, was, as we would expect. Um, and in this data, 
um, it suggested to us that uh, every additional 200 milliliters of fluid consumed each day uh, reduces the risk of kidney stones by about 13%. So I think this is helpful in clinic uh, when advising patients. Uh, we sort of come out with general ideas around drinking two to three liters, but actually even just increasing their daily fluid intake by 200 mils will have an impact. So every little does uh, make a difference. Uh, if you can increase your fluid even a small amount, it will help. So patients should be encouraged to do their best, even if they can't manage uh, the higher fluid intakes, which you probably recommend. Um, this, this paper is slightly unusual and, and got me thinking. This is a paper from um, uh, San Francisco, from the Stollers Group, um, published in August in the BJUI. Uh, and they used EPR uh, data, uh, which I think will become a trend. Uh, one of the things we have now with EPR is a huge amount of uh, patient information. And what they did was looked at 14 million body temperature measurements recorded in their electronic patient system um, in over half a million patients. And then they looked and excluded patients with infection and, and other causes of a raised body temperature. And they looked at basically their core body temperature and their basal body temperatures. And they, they matched 7,000 stone formers with controls and they matched them for the usual things, gender, BMI, um, conditions, medication, uh, in a very comprehensive matching process. And uh, once they'd done all this, they found that kidney stone formers actually had a small but statistically higher body temperature compared to the controls. Uh, and actually for every uh, one degree of uh, raised body temperature, there was a 21% increase in kidney stone risk. Um, we don't know and they don't know what this means, uh, but maybe um, stone formers have a higher metabolic rate uh, or some reason why their body temperature is slightly higher. And as I say, this is not explained by infection. Um, this is uh, due to their sort of core background temperatures. So an interesting finding. Um, this genetic study um, was published in Nature Communications and there's not many uh, stone publications uh, in, in this uh, journal. And this is again from um, Sarah Howells in Oxford. Um, and Sarah looked using the UK Biobank again and did a genetic um, genome-wide association study. So looking at the genetics of the patients within the Biobank. And she pulled out over 12,000 stone formers and compared them to over 400,000 controls. And by doing this, produced this sort of Manhattan plot on the top right here and identified 20 uh, loci, 20 genetic areas associated with kidney stone formation. And seven of these had not been reported previously. Um, several of these were involved in vitamin D metabolism and calcium sensing receptor. And uh, Sarah went on to validate some of these uh, in, in studies. And these potentially form promising avenues uh, for targeting and for categorizing patients, and maybe even for developing drugs for certain uh, categories of patients. Um, we've also looked at the utility of blood tests um, for metabolic uh, detection of metabolic disorders in kidney stone patients. And um, this was a study done by Katie Eyre. And um, the purpose of this study was really to look at whether measuring uh, the serum levels of calcium, PTH, urate and chloride, et cetera, were, were valuable in predicting patients with metabolic stone disorders. Uh, so this, we looked at our local database of 709 stone formers. And we found that 2.3% in an unselected group uh, had an elevated serum calcium. And this obviously helped diagnose primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, but the additional tests um, did not prove cost effective uh, and indeed may provide false reassurance if they're normal uh, in detecting metabolic disorders. So the conclusion here is that blood tests alone are not sufficient to diagnose or treat metabolic causes of stones. Uh, serum calcium is useful as a screening test, and indeed that's what's in the NICE guidance. But if you're going to look for other metabolic causes of stones, you do need a full assessment, including a 24-hour urine, uh, to pick these up. So don't be reassured by normal blood tests uh, in this setting. Um, moving on to diagnostics. Uh, this study um, 
uh, this paper from the from the US um, looked at a um, an assay using biomarkers of cell free DNA in urine, and this panel uh, uses six biomarkers, and they looked at 136 uh, spot samples of urine, and tried to work out if this panel of biomarkers could predict whether the patient had stones or not. And they def defined some thresholds and had good sensitivity and specificity for stone uh, presence. Um, and they also looked longitudinally at individual patients and looked to see if their score changed according to their stone status. Uh, and they found that it might be a, a promising way to triage patients or to follow up patients um, to see if they're likely to be forming new stones in the future rather than having to do repeat imaging. Um, so obviously this is just six biomarkers and potentially this could be extended or refined, uh, but an interesting initial um, publication. Um, moving on to health economics. Um, the, this study from in, in April looked at the economic burden of kidney stones in the UK. Um, this hasn't really been looked at um, too much previously. And what they did here was looked at low and high costs of uh, treatments, and then came up with a cost estimate um, based on volumes uh, between these, these levels. Um, and they came up with a number of a cost of stone uh, management uh, in 2010 of between 190 and 324 million pounds. And they pointed out this is comparable to the combined cost of bladder and prostate cancer for the entirety of the UK. Um, so clearly management of stone disease is very expensive and given the epidemiological data um, will presumably become increasingly so. Uh, and perhaps we should also think about maybe how we can reduce this economic burden. And uh, we've seen in previous talks um, how shockwave lithotripsy has uh, given a high billing in the NICE guidance. And this paper that followed from the NICE guidance shows the uh, health economics of management with ureteroscopy compared to shockwave lithotripsy. Um, although it acknowledges that shockwave lithotripsy is less effective at initial stone clearance and ureteroscopy is much more expensive and in this uh, analysis, they estimate it's £2,387 more per episode to manage a stone with ureteroscopy than with shockwave lithotripsy. And what they found here was that even uh, if the uh, lithotripsy was very poorly effective, say down to 40%, uh, ureteroscopy would still be uh, much more costly. Um, they also looked at whether delays in treatment would justify the additional cost uh, and looked at quality of life benefits. And again, couldn't really um, find any um, benefits for ureteroscopy. And so on this basis, um, they've recommended that shockwave lithotripsy should uh, be first line treatment for ureteric stones. And again, as I say, this is in line with the uh, NICE guidance. Um, one thing that I've always been slightly suspicious about is around some of the uh, things that predict whether lithotripsy is going to be successful or not. And this uh, paper looked at which features uh, are more likely to predict stone-free status after shockwave lithotripsy. And one of the key messages from this paper was that um, lower pole kidney stones actually have good um, success rates with shockwave lithotripsy. Um, and the only things that really make a difference are the stone size, its density in terms of Hounsfield units, and the skin to stone distance. But the uh, location of the stone in the kidney uh, doesn't really impact at all on the success rate of clearance, and uh, not statistically. And so we shouldn't be discouraged from putting patients with lower pole stones uh, on the lithotripter. Um, we've started to hear about some new lasers in the last year. Um, this uh, publication looks at the 
or compares uh, Holden and YAG and the new super pulsed Fulium fiber lasers. Uh, on the top right here, you can see the different shapes of pulses that different lasers generate. Uh, the green line is the um, sort of the uh, Holmium uh, lasers, and then the black is the uh, double pulse from the Moses laser, and the two blue and purple ones are from the Fulium fiber laser. Um, and you can see uh, in the bottom uh, two uh, graphs, the effects on retropulsion and ablation. So uh, I think we're going to see more about pulse shape and pulse modulation uh, in the future as these new lasers start to be introduced. Uh, this is an interesting uh, publication that I found uh, from the end of last year. And this uh, system uh, looks at autofluorescence from the stones. So when the uh, illumination from the uh, scope is shone on the stone, uh, there's a laser firing both forward and there's detecting autofluorescence when the stone is coming back. And the further you are away from the stone, the less of this autofluorescence uh, is captured. Uh, and what this allowed was to build in a feedback loop so that if the uh, laser was uh, more than a millimeter away from the stone, it wouldn't fire. And uh, if the stone, if the laser was too close to tissue, it would detect that as a different autofluorescence from stone. And again, it wouldn't fire. Um, so it builds in a sort of automatic safety feature uh, so that the laser will only fire when it's uh, close to a stone and it recognizes the stone by this autofluorescence uh, feedback uh, from it. And so this sort of safety system, I think, will be an interesting addition to laser uh, use. Um, why shouldn't we have some robots in stone surgery? Well, here is one that's proposed uh, at the end of last year for ultrasound guided um, versus uh, X-ray guided uh, access. This device uh, seen in the top right uh, was placed on a phantom and uh, users were asked to either try and puncture these targets with ultrasound guidance or a robotic system was used with fluoroscopy uh, to guide the needle uh, into each of these targets. Uh, so the idea here is that this contraption would be placed on the patient uh, and the uh, user would identify which calyx they wanted to hit and then the robot would line everything up and triangulate it for you automatically so that the needle could be advanced directly onto your target of choice. Um, so again, improving the access for PCNL. Um, this um, study uh, in the Asian Journal of Surgery uh, looked at 15 randomized controlled trials involving nearly a thousand patients and compared tubeless PCNL with standard PCNL. And here we see that most of the outcome measures are, uh, standard ones here are equivalent, but many are better with a tubeless uh, PCNL uh, technique. Uh, so this, um, these, these 15 studies that they analyzed in this uh, manuscript all suggest that tubeless PCNL uh, will have benefits uh, for the patient. Um, I think we're moving into the era of artificial intelligence. And this study uh, published in June uh, looked at deep learning computer vision algorithms. And then what they did here was took some photographs of different types of stone, uh, broke the photographs down into small uh, pixels, little um, squares, and then used a learning network to try and identify these at random. Um, the system analyzed 63 stones and was able to recognize stones with reasonable accuracy. And ultimately, potentially, these algorithms could be applied in real time to endoscopic images, which may allow us to identify types of stone and maybe automate some of the settings in terms of laser uh, technology to improve um, the or op 
optimize the ablation of, of a different type of a stone based on its um, appearance. And the final couple of slides look at um, follow-up of stone patients. Uh, this study um, published in February looked at whether urologists follow up patients after they've had ureteroscopy. Uh, they looked across uh, their state and they found that only 47.6% of patients who'd undergone a ureteroscopy had any post-operative imaging. And as you can see from the graph on the right, the majority of stenters fell below 50% in terms of post-operative imaging. Um, most of this imaging was done with x-ray, but some were with ultrasound or CT. And there was a reasonably high variation between the institutions within a state as to whether they followed up the patients with any imaging. Um, but this is consistent with previous studies, which show that the majority of patients uh, don't get any imaging. And so the question is raised, do you arrange imaging for your patients uh, following ureteroscopy? Is that valuable? And is it remiss if you don't? And I suppose on a positive note, uh, this uh, paper uh, looked at the impact of phone counselling on patients and urinary prevention. Many of us have changed to uh, phone consultations, and this study showed that these uh, phone consultations uh, uh, lead to better adherence uh, in terms of follow-up and also better 24-hour urine parameters. So perhaps a a uh, quick phone call uh, to motivate patients, particularly when they might be unable to come to clinic, uh, can still have value uh, for these patients, uh, particularly in the era of COVID. I hope this gives you an interesting uh, overview of some papers that I found interesting in the last year. And um, I'm sure there are many others, uh, but um, these are the ones that caught my eye. Thank you for listening.